Hello everyone. Uh, today we're going to be talking about curation as valuation. Um, some of you have kind of initially expressed some, um, several of you I should say, uh, have expressed some concerns about the idea of value and um, what exactly that means. And so um, it means a lot of things basically. Uh, for me and the purposes of this course it is a way of examining essentially the semiotics of artwork. How does artwork accrue a meaning? Sometimes that meaning, quote unquote, is equatable to a dollar sign. Because on, if you look at these things as just market objects, one thing could be worth $15. That's it, whatever it was, it's exchanged for $15. So that's one very, very tiny, tiny, tiny conversation about meaning. The other, conversation about value and meaning is the, the breadth, everything else, what everything else can mean. And um, A, that's the more important thing, right? It's like a lot more interesting to talk about the possibilities and the potential of what art can mean as opposed to it meaning this one tiny infinitesimal thing. Um, but the art market is getting a lot of attention. I feel like it's important to know. It's also the the um, the moment where all of the objects can speak the same language for one one time uh, like in in a very specific moment in the market when the thing comes to value comes to be looked at for value uh, it is then presented as equal among all these things before judgment equal before judgment and then the judgment tells you how much the thing is actually worth so um, what that process is called is a tournament of value. And I'm gonna be talking to you about a show that I put together called a tournament of value. Um, and it was an exhibition that I did last year. It's one that I uh, think very fondly of. I had a lot of fun putting it together, but it also co brings a lot of the conversations that we're talking about together. But before I go to that, I wanna kind of briefly run through my lesson on semiotics, just so I know we're all talking about the same thing as we move forward. I find this helpful because there are a lot of different approaches to this term and as such, it can become kind of muddied in one's head. Um, so the example that I use uh, is the little red fruit. Um, and this is an ex uh, a lesson on explaining signification. So, um, in Roland Myth's, uh, Roland Myth, Roland Barth, Roland Barth's Myth Today, excuse me, um, which has been assigned reading at some point from me to you, uh, so I hope you remember it, I hope you remember this specific thing. I've talked about this before, but I just want to run through it again, because I've made these nice new infographics, and why not share them with you. Um, so, ultimately, what we're talking about right now is how things accrue meaning. And this entire course is going to be asking that question. Why does a work of art mean this to you as a viewer? Why does it mean this to a critic in order for that person to pen uh, an argument about it? Why does it mean this thing to a curator who wants to put it into a conversation? And so like words and like all language, we're talking about how things accrue meaning. And so the example that I give is this little red fruit. Um, this was... I'll get back to that in a second. So we start off with this little red fruit. Now, before you know words, before you know language, you can identify this object as a little red fruit. So if we put this little red fruit where it should be situated in this chart, it is then it then becomes the signified. It becomes the object that is waiting for a meaning to be applied to it. So you see this thing, you can identify it as little because of its what it is. You can identify it as fruit because of where it hangs on a tree. Um, so some of the meanings that you can possibly engage with is eating it, is it sweet, is it bitter? But for our purposes, we're gonna talk about the words and how those words are applied. And so the, the signifier, see, signifier, is the word of the language that's applied to that object. And so what happens is 
these two ideas become embedded or entangled with one another. And we now, as people in the English speaking world, identify that little red fruit with this five letter word, A-P-P-L-E, apple. So that's first level signification. That's how we identify these things as, uh, you know, jar, or in my case, glass, water. Um, that's how language works. How things work on another level is called second tier signification. Roland, Mar Roland Barth deals with it under the title myth. And so we take this new sign, this new co-mingled, entangled language object of the little red fruit that we know of as apple, and we tell a story, and we employ that little red apple as a prop in that story. And so what we're adding then is signification. This began as a jar. I've added a, a different context to it, and it has become a glass of water give more examples um, and so one idea that we then ascribe to this apple is the narrative of a forbidden fruit in the case of both the biblical tradition of Adam and Eve or the fabled story uh, I give the example here of, no, of Snow White so it all goes back to this thing if you're told specific stories in specific traditions you will identify this little red fruit not only as an apple but as, say, an omen of potential disgrace or the exodus from Eden, you know? Um, this is my favorite fall of Adam and Eve painting from 1470 uh, because, as the Bible tells it, the serpent, when coaxing Eve to get this apple, um, still had arms and legs, and in, in anger against his actions towards Eve, he punished the serpent by removing its uh, legs, arms and legs histories everybody um, so that's signification and so um, obviously you know I wish that in um, the flaw here in Barth's argument is uh, that I'm of course talking about the object again becoming signified with more information more text where it, like Apple is here because it's the term that we apply to it or water is here filling the vessel up it's kind of like filling the that little red fruit up with the word Apple and, but then we're filling it up again with the nar these narratives. So I wish that this number one was signified and this number two was signifier, but whatever, beggars can't be choosers. But getting back to this thing and uh, our arguments in class, um, I want to pull from uh, Gita, Kupar, Gita Kapoor, excuse me, uh, Curating and Heterogeneous Worlds. I'm on the bottom of page 179 in this book. <clears throat> the exhibition was premised, I think all exhibitions are premised on this platform, um, the exhibition was premised on works that were explicitly located where signs and meaning were embedded in the material conditions of their production. It presented artists with a rich understanding of a situational phenomenology, which in turn demanded spectoral comprehension of how these artworks navigated between ritual protocol and political transgression. Ritual protocol, every work of art that is ever presented as a work of art is presented through a ritual of visual consumption. We see a work of art in an art gallery, we therefore understand it as a work of art. It's a thing that has a meaning. All, excuse me, um, all works of art function in this way. And that's why works of art are more easily curated into generative discussions with one another, whereas, uh, because they pose questions. Whereas design objects have this kind of clunky time being put into these conversations because they're use values. They're, they're posing answers, not questions. And that's why people like to curate and develop conversations with fine artwork, myself being one of those people. So <clears throat> uh, what, what Kapoor here is, is talking about is the fact that artworks have a meaning and so they have a signification that signification is defined say by the parameters of the person who made it it's defined by as she explains uh, the material conditions of their production so who made it what what it's made of when it was made all of these material conditions um, and 
these all are the signifiers. We have the thing, the artwork, and there's all of these signifiers that keep putting more information into it, giving us the sign. This was a work made by you know, Hugo van der Goes. That that's the material conditions. And so that's part of the meaning of this work of art. This work of art is always regarded as a painting because it hangs on a wall and is made out of the same things. Now, um, what curators tend to do is operate on that second tier level of signification. What a curator does is has an idea or that is salient to works of art that they are seeing in the world. The, that there's, say, a lot of work that is dealing with, as the show that I'm about to talk to you about, uh, Conspicuous Consumption, uh, I decided to bring some of these artworks together to see how they would have a conversation, knowing that they each would bring with them a complete sign. They were the, uh, an item, an idea, uh, a, a, a question in one unit. But by bringing them into conversation, they have the potential of relating to one another and speaking to one another in this really powerful way that um, has is the reason why curatorial practice has really um, upped its ante lately because people like this idea of presenting, um, of, of adding signification, telling stories, as it were, with material objects. So, excuse me. I could have paused that, but whatever, right? Um, within a tournament of value was the title of the show. Uh, it, I refer to it as a salon considering works by, not necessarily as an exhibition, because as this list you can see um, has authors of both text and artwork. And uh, as I just said, bringing all of these things into one room for one conversation for, in this instance, t only two weeks, which was kind of a bummer, but whatever, um, was all part of how I was framing this conversation. Um, now. I say on the bottom, at the bottom of this list of people, that this conversation was afforded by the National Endowment for the Arts, who gave uh, Flux Factory an endowment to have a curatorial resident in their uh, New York City loft space. Um, I was one of those people that was chosen to be one of these people, and so my curatorial nom de plume, the Institute for American Art, was embedded in this conversation as well. I was the one who called this symposium, as it were. And I'm using these words, these like to refer to this as a panel or a symposium, because all of the text that we have in the world is active. It's always communicating its, its thingness to us. And no one says this more concretely than Arjan Apadura, who is alphabetically the top person on this list. Um, in his text, uh, the Social Life of Things, which I have in my bookshelf, but I don't have to show you. A Social Life of Things. But um, in his introduction to that text, he brings up this term within, or the term tournament of value. Now, hang tight. I got the book. Social Life of Things. So this is what Epidura says about a tournament of value. Uh, tournaments of value are complex periodic events that are removed in some culturally well-defined way from the routines of economic life. Participation in them is likely to be both a privilege of those in power and an instrument of status contests between them. The currency of such tournaments is also likely to be set apart through well-understood cultural diacritics. Finally, what is at issue in such tournaments is not just status, rank, fame, or reputation of actors, but the disposition of the central tokens of value in the society in question. Finally, though such tournaments of value occur in special times and places, their forms and outcomes are always consequential for the more mundane realities of power and value in ordinary life. If you have to stop, go back, and walk through that quote again, that's totally fine. That's why these things are video lectured. Um, it's like rereading notes. Um, me, forever. 
So what Apodura brings up in this text, what I find very fascinating is, um, what I find fascinating specifically about the art market is it's that moment, right? As I said in the beginning of lecture, this is the moment when the art object comes into play as a means of having a conversation about the artist and their career and their ideas, the gallery, its position in the world, the collector who may potentially purchase this thing, the writer who may potentially write about these things. They, all of these, these things come together for a tournament, and it's a tournament of value. Now, um, what happens, I think, to extend Epidura's uh, Apaderai, excuse me, uh, I keep, I, I mispronounced his name for a very long time, and I keep defaulting back to that initial mispronunciation. mispronunciation. Pardon me, Dr. Apaderai. Um, so what I think can be extended from this uh, definition of a tournament of value is it doesn't just have to be market exchange. Um, this is something that a pattern I will go into more thoroughly, as will other authors in this text. But um, a gift giving situation is a tournament of value because you want to impress the person you're giving a gift to. You know, Valentine's Day is coming up. Think about it. What a weird holiday based solely around the social practice of giving gifts. Um, so that's one tournament of value. Uh, but also the purchasing of things is probably the easiest tournament of value. Um, another tournament of value, I think, is when things <clears throat> um, just evaporate. Like what happens when a thing becomes inconcrete, or a thing becomes intangible, or a thing breaks? What do we do then? And um, I thought specifically about that aspect of a tournament of value, that aspect of buying something that's fleeting. Of spending money and uh, and you know having this full presentation of your social status on view to to buy something that was is momentary. Um, it's like when people buy a very very lavish meal, that meal is going to be consumed and be finished. It's not a work of art; it's a meal. Um, but people still do it. It's it's this wonderful exchange, and so. What I decided to do as a curator, specifically spending government money and presenting works deliberately, get this, between April Fool's Day and Tax Day, I decided to spend government money and so, uh, to, to buy works of art that would break. Here are some shots of the exhibition. This is just kind of, um, this is the bookshelf that I was using, which is a table. I said it was a salon, meaning I had a couch down there, this table, people would come and hang out and talk. Um, one of the projects that would um, obsolesce, as it were, was Peter Semensky's um, evaporation of gold dust. So what Peter Semensky did in this case was he and I equated how much it would be to rent this gallery space out for one night in, Lo in Long Island City, New York. It would cost $950, $750 for rent, $200 for a deposit. So arguably you could get that money back, but maybe not. So what Peter did was he spent $950 of National Endowment for the Arts money and sprayed it into the space in the form of gold dust. And here you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, Peter with the spray bottle spraying, um, and then next to it, you can see the gold dust floating through the air. We had, an, there's not that much gold dust for $950, but uh, we had enough to be able to continually spray the air um, every, every so often as, or not every so often, every time a person was in the space. Julia Wiest <coughs> presented this work where uh, the, the work of art consists of a wine glass that is filled with water and placed in a freezer. What will happen as the ice freezes, it expands, cracking the glass, but as it cracks, the glass becomes embedded in the ice. And so the work of art consists of bringing that, that now co-mingled glass ice block out for public view. As the ice melts, the glass falls apart, as you can see on the image on the left. The image on the right uh, is the full of glass. And so the, as the ice melts, water 
collects on top of the pedestal and drifts off, and the the work of art is quite literally evaporates. Then you sweep up the glass, and it's gone. Now, for exhibition, we could reproduce this project every day, but if somebody purchased one of these editions, they were only given one glass. And so the collector would spend X amount of dollars in their tournament of value purchasing this work, only to then present this work in another tournament of value where he's kind of showing off, or they are showing off, for people that they want to present the work to. I mean, and I say showing off in the best way possible. I have a museum in my house because I like to show off the artwork that I really like. This is another evidence of that. Um, Roman Andek, uh, who, um, not an American artist, I don't really know why I say that, but uh, maybe because it was this like really fun feat of trying to negotiate with galleries and collectors to get this work. I was like calling Vancouver and Paris and um, hilarious what you have to do to put together an art show. Um, so what Roman Andak's work consisted of was uh, incising the glass window with a circle that was about that big and then sticking a balloon in and inflating the balloon so that at one point the hopefully equal amounts of air existed on either side of the glass. Now what does this have to do with obsolescence? Well when I was speaking with the collector who purchased this work uh, who I borrowed the work from uh, in Vancouver, this lovely collecting family out there, uh, they install the work periodically meaning that every time they install this artwork in their home, their home is effectively broken. It needs a repairman to come and, and deal with how this artwork messes with or obsolesces the entire structure of the house, which is a, another fantastic tournament of value. The purchasing of it was purchasing an idea. I was, I, on a phone call, I was given permission to reproduce this work based on this idea, but I had to go through that phone call because that's what conceptual art is about. So for the tournament value of purchasing the, this work, it was as much as a handshake. But the tournament value for presenting this work means that I had to go out, I had to purchase this glass, I had to take a window off, put the window back on, breaking the gallery down, putting the gallery back together, and this funny circuit of presenting artwork. Now, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Dana Sherwood here, uh, two years ago at another space afforded by Flux Factory, uh, Dana presented a birthday cake that was also to be a habitat for mice, a small family of mice. This was the birthday cake. Two years later, I Commit, I had the cake come out of storage and be presented in the space as this commentary on this on decadence or or the decadence but also the the maintenance of decadence this cake was designed to obsolesce but because it didn't fully break down it has become a very precious icon it's it is very much like a relic it's kept in this perfect box, in a perfect climate control situation, a reliquary of modern day, of the modern day, I guess I should say. <clears throat> um, dogs. Uh, and is brought out every so often so that we can all walk around it and venerate the work that is there before us. Um, this was a really kind of fabulously gross thing to present because it looks so lavish it's so decadent how it's designed and how it's decorated but then you can see mouse pellets uh, commingled with the frosting and then actually commingled with the gold dust that landed on it after being sprayed in the space Ryan McGinnis uh, presented the work of art that says one dollar off anything anywhere which was a coupon and the idea is that you present this dollar for one dollar off. Um, when putting together the show about monetary value and artwork, I wanted to have a work that directly communicated with a broader economic market. And this work, I think, functions in that way. So to utilize the coupon is to spend the dollar. So it's kind of a one-to-one. -one. But 
to utilize the coupon is to undermine the tournament of value that this piece went through as an artwork. This work of art is worth more money than just one dollar. But it creates this dual identity. It's doubled itself psychologically because we have a dollar. It's still a buck. You can still spend it as a buck. But it has become this other thing that is an artwork by kind of arguably the most famous of the artistic authors on that list or the most well established um, on that list, Ryan McGinnis is a big. Ryan McGinley, excuse me, is a big McGinnis. Whoa, uh, is a big name in the printmaking world and the in, in the art world more broadly. So, um, but here it is. It's a buck. Um, I mean, the frame costs more than a dollar to make. So, and um, additionally, I wanted to have something biological, something alive in this exhibition, and I knew the exhibition was going to run for fifteen days. And talking to um, Dana Sherwood, the uh, artist who presented the cake work, we landed on the life cycle of these butterflies. Their life cycle was about 10 to 15 days, and we knew that by ordering them at a certain time, they would have they would spend the first two days of their short life in transit, in a box. You could buy you just buy them on the internet, um, and so these live things entered into the space. And we released them. There were 45, there were 40 of them, excuse me. Um, no, no, excuse me, there were not 40 of them. It wasn't that much of a massacre. There were, uh, there were 30, 28 were alive out of the box. Two of them perished in travel. Um, and I, I, thinking about this, I had approached this very conceptually and just kind of between us all here, uh, it was very, very, emotionally disturbing to sit in this gallery space, which I did every day for open hours, um, and listen to these poor animals spend their entire life in this awkward met, uh, cement gallery space. It made me think a lot about uh, economic systems. It made me think a lot about w workers' rights. It, it um, in a very kind of uh, direct way, the fact that this, that these, lives were in this space for that amount of time um one one actually survived the duration of the show but uh, they were given food and given a nice habitat but um it really upped the ante on the conversation about value in a very very direct way in a way that i was surprised by as the curator um and that was kind of it, uh, is the point of curating so <clears throat> I just want to show you, and these are kind of awkward slides, but you can see some of the gold dust that's landing on the balloon and some of the gold dust that's on the floor of the Flux Factory Gallery, but um, in the water that was left by Julia Wiest's melted ice. So when talking about the way the artworks can have a conversation, this is perhaps the most direct physical matter way. So there was actually gold dust from one work that was connecting all of the pieces except for the butterflies. We did our research, figured out that the gold dust would be small enough to to cause some potential respiratory problems for the bugs, um, for the lives. And so we kept the gold dust away from them, uh, which was fairly easy because it's, it's a heavy dust, so it kind of settles pr fairly quickly. Um, but it floats around enough and near to these other sculptures that it landed on it, creating a physical conversation between the works of art. So, um, end conversation about curatorial practice, uh, and we will talk a little bit about um, what I'd like for you to do for this week. I'm curious how you all are getting through these readings. Um, I realize that by privileging this research paper and not having a discussion board, I'm just kind of wondering out here to myself um, where you're all at. And so um, I would like to to catch, catch up. Um, but actually, I'm realizing in my notes, I'm skipping ahead. I'm going to go back to that last slide real quick. And um, I'm not going to edit any of this stuff out because I'm doing very well talking to myself in my apartment. Um, so we're just going to go back to this and 
And I want to read two quotes from the, re from the readings from last week and this week. So, um, you know, here I am talking about being a curator and using these works to have a conversation with one another. But one of the things that I really appreciate for Kapoor's text, in Kapoor's text, is that um, at the end, it's a curator acknowledging that the artist is the person who is directing these conversations. And so in figuring out who I wanted to put in this exhibition, it wasn't a matter of who I wanted to work with. It was a matter of the work being presented as a, a complete sign, as I was saying in the beginning of the lecture. And so on 187 of our textbook, um, Kapoor says, the artist is always situated, but also always liminal to the established order of things, and thus peculiarly placed to question the hegemonic tendencies of national and global ethnic and imperialist ideologies. Now, not every exhibition is going to be established on political lines, but with the reference to the butterflies and how the butterflies lived out their existence, and then the idea that the, probably the people who mined the gold that was sprayed in the space were paid a dollar a day and treated very similarly to the butterflies in the situation, brings up the fact that if you look at these, these modes of production, they always are political. Everything always can be argued as political or becomes political in a certain argument. So um, Kapoor very clearly s states that, you know, as curators, we're here to kind of host a conversation or in, this, in the instance of this exhibition, host a salon. But it's the artists who are there to present these questions and to demand that people recognize these questions. And so um, when work is asked to be curated into exhibitions, don't think of it as being um, if the curator's perspective is different than how you read the work. I mean, if you hate the idea, don't show the work. But if the person presents questions to you that you think your work answers, then um, see, see how it goes. But be wary of curators that, that don't know the questions they want their exhibitions to, to answer um, or, or pose. A lot of curators, like a lot of art critics, are not really there for the work. They're there for some other gratification. Who knows what it is? But um, so kind of go with caution. But um, similarly to Kapoor, Krauss, in our other textbook, The Anti-Aesthetic, which I hope you all have and are in love with because this is my favorite book. Um, I'm serious. This is probably my favorite book. So um, at the end of Krauss's argument of sculpture, there she is. Um, and so at the end of her argument on sculpture, what Krauss says on page 46 of the Anti-Aesthetic, or at least my edition of it, um, talks about artists as well. So she, as a critic, d is discussing the various ways that sculpture can operate in the world and how that, what that says about art, what that says about the world, what that says about our understanding as the audience of those things. But then she also steps back and says, but you know what? These artists of today, um, they're, uh, you know, they're eclectic. Um, but what appears as eclectic from one point of view can be seen as rigorously logical from another. The biggest criticism about postmodernism is that it has this kind of disrupted aesthetic. There's a fragmenting of the personal style into a, di a diverse array of modalities or modes of practice. And so oftentimes, and I've been guilty of saying this of quite a few exhibitions, to walk into a solo exhibition of an artist who I might know as a ceramicist or as a painter and see the combination of those two and maybe several other material choices, uh, dogs, um, several other material choices, all of these things actually are coming from the same perspective. Uh, but for me, for my criticism, I'm saying, oh, it looks like a group show. Oh, that looks like a group show. This is, it's the aesthetic of looking like a group show. What Krauss defends and actually establishes for postmodern discourse is that artists 
are in the mix to be eclectic and to present other modes of looking at the same problem. So um, that's not to say that if you're very resigned to being a painter because that's the practice you're interested in pursuing, that that's invalid. But uh, more than anything, Krauss is kind of acknowledging that we can see meaning and um, in meaning and combination and conversation in a multiplicity of forms. We don't have to have just a painting gallery and just a sculpture gallery. We can have artists that have these eclectic dispositions where I'm asking a question, say, about community. How do I pose that question in several ways to get a variety of different information back so that I now know more about community? Make your work productive. Um, 35 minutes is kind of a long lecture, but it's two weeks, so um, that's it. Uh, I'm going to open the discussion board right now, and that's all. See ya.